In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that that light was good. Many of you will recognize that as the first four verses of the Bible, the beginning of the creation narrative that we have in Genesis. What we see there is God speaking. The first words spoken in Scripture, the first words that we see recorded as spoken in the Bible is God speaking and creating light, light that is necessary for our lives, life that is necessary for our universe to function the way it does. We need light. We believe that we understand light. We can explain it scientifically. We've given it a name. We, we define it as electromagnetic waves. And if I pull that apart, and I, I understand each of those segments by itself, but when you put them all together, I guess that's light. <laughs> Just another name for light. We can measure it. We measure the frequency of those waves, and we give those frequencies names. We group them together and give names to those like radio, micro, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. We have names and frequencies for light. We know what light does. It's an exposer. It's a revealer. It shows us things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see. It's an enhancer. It makes our lives better. Colors stand out the more we give light to them. Those surfaces need light to shine on them so that we can see those particular colors and the shades that they are. Light's also an attractor. It brings life to it. Um, people are attracted to light. Insects are attracted to light. Many living things are attracted and go toward light. And I believe that when God said, let there be light, what he created was so much more than we have figured out yet. And someday when we stand in his presence, we're going to go, that's what light is. And we're going to understand it at a deeper level. Now, if you would, I want to ask you to turn to John chapter 8 for the text we're going to look at today. We'll be starting in verse 12. We're in the second week of a new series called I Am. Tom was showing us last week how to really understand the significance of I Am. We have to go all the way back to Exodus 3 where Moses asks God what his name is so he can take that name to the people of Israel. I'm sure that Adam and Eve probably knew God's name very well when they were in the garden with God. And as man sinned and drew away from God over time, his name was also forgotten. And people quit referring to him by his name. And so by the time of Moses, he had to be reminded, he had to know what God's name was. Well, John, in his text, um, he's revealing to us Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah. He is the second person of the Trinity. And as he begins to reveal that truth to us, like a snowball rolling down the hill, we gather more and more facts about him. He starts with the Word. This Word is with God, and yet the Word is at the same time God. Not a part of the creation, but there at the creation. In fact, the creation happened through him and with him and by him. By verse 14, the word that is God becomes flesh and dwells with us. And we know that this is Jesus that he's describing here. He continues this theme throughout his gospel, revealing more and more that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Chosen One, by using these I am statements. And he continues to hammer home this idea that Jesus is God in the flesh. <clears throat> but we have to understand Exodus 3 to really understand what that means. Jesus as the I am himself. All right, I want to ask you if you're able to please stand as we read God's words to us this morning. From John chapter 8, we're starting in verse 12, we'll go through verse 20. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right because I am not alone. I stand with, my, uh, with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the one who sent me, the Father. Then they asked him, where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come. God's inspired authoritative words to us today. Thank you. You can be seated. We want to see today that uh, what exactly Jesus means to us as the light of the world. What does that mean to us and how does it impact our lives? That's what we're looking at today. To get there though, we need to go back a little bit. The beginning of this story, the beginning of this little narrative actually starts in John chapter 7. And what we see there is Jesus with his family and they're deciding to go to Jerusalem to observe the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was one of seven feasts that were uh, commissioned by, the, by our Lord, by God himself, in the first five books of the Bible. And it's the last of the seven. It starts with Passover and ends with uh, Tabernacles, which is exactly six months and one day later. It's a week-long festival. And uh, God gave them prescriptions on how to observe it. Over time, there were a couple things that were added to that ceremony. Things that God didn't commission, and yet Jesus uses to make major proclamations about himself and his kingdom. <laughs> I want to show you how that works. In chapter 7, verse 37 of John, we see something uh, that Jesus says. One more thing before I read this. Uh, the, the one ceremony that I want to talk about first here is a water ceremony. And in this water ceremony, the high priest would take a pitcher and he would walk from the, the temple all the way down to the pool of Siloam. He'd fill up the pitcher and then he'd come back to the temple and he'd pour it out into a basin that was by the altar. And people would line this, this uh, walkway that he would use and they would cheer and sing. And it was this really happy sort of parade type thing. And there'd be other musicians probably following, playing music and priests and things like that. So anyway, this, this big procession, it was a big deal, and this happened on the last day of this festival. So with that in mind, verse 37 of chapter 7 says this, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if a man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. That's the backdrop for Jesus' proclamation. It's not super obvious to us because we don't know that tradition. But that would have meant something big to those people. The other one, and the one that's more uh, connected to the sermon today, is a light ceremony. And at the beginning of that week, they would put these big candelabra all around uh, the temple, and they would hang them from the walls and the city walls, and they would light these things. Uh, and then people would walk around with candles and lanterns and lamps, and it was just big light festival, and they would stay up all night with these lights burning, and um, it was very bright in the city of Jerusalem, and that's how they would begin the week. And it would continue all throughout the week, but in a, in a lesser capacity, but light was a big part of this ceremony as well. Those uh, lights in that ceremony pointed to two things. One was that God was with them in the, in the desert for 40 years as a pillar of fire, that he was present with them and he made himself obvious to them in that fire and they knew that he was present with them. And the other was that someday when the Messiah comes, the Messiah would be a light to Jews and Gentiles alike. Now knowing those two things, Jesus stands up in front of these people, 
probably just as this uh, feast is ending, and says, I am the light of the world. That light that you're celebrating, the light that you're remembering, the light that was with the people in Israel uh, and in the desert for 40 years, that was me. I was with them back then, showing them the way, even then. And that Messiah that's supposed to come and be a light to the Gentiles and the Jews alike, that's me. This is a huge, huge declaration from Jesus. What's very interesting is what follows, what should have followed is you are a blasphemer. You deserve death. That's the response he should have gotten if they don't believe that this is true. And for all the billions of people that have ever existed, this would have been blasphemy, except for one. And he's the one saying it in this verse. And what, it, what follows is an argument that's akin to ignoring the elephant in the room and getting upset over the fly that came in with it. You don't have another witness to say this is true, so that makes it invalid. What? He's claiming to be God himself, and you're going to get upset because there's not another witness to, to testify to that? It's almost like they're saying, we kind of believe that. We just need another witness. Just think about how big a statement he is making when he says, I am the light of the world. Well, there's three things I want to show us in terms of what this means, what Jesus is declaring, what he's trying to show as the light of the world. And the first one is that Jesus as the light exposes sin and reveals righteousness. Again, this story started in uh, chapter 7. I want to go back to verse 7. He's having a bit of an argument with his brothers as they're getting ready to leave. And um, they're kind of making fun of him, saying, well, you ought to go to Jerusalem. That's where the followers are. If you want people to follow, you've got to go where people can follow. They're, they're kind of giving him the needle here. It's not a nice, pleasant conversation. This is his response. The right time for me has not yet come. For you, any time is right. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify to what it does is evil. Jesus doesn't put up with the nonsense of sin. He speaks about it. He shows it. One interesting place where Jesus shows us the depths of our sin is in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5. We had a sermon series on the Beatitudes, and, and not too long after that, in the sermon, he begins to talk about what the law really means, what the commandments really say, and he begins with murder. You've heard that it was said, don't murder. And everybody's like, yeah, well, we haven't murdered. I've never killed somebody. And he says, yeah, but have you ever wanted to? In here, have you ever wanted to hurt somebody real bad? Have you ever been so angry, you kind of lost control of your thoughts and you were hoping something terrible would happen to them? Well, then you've broken that command. How about adultery? Well, I've never, never cheated on my spouse, my husband, my wife. I've never done that. But have you ever thought impure thoughts about somebody else? If so, you've broken that one as well. He goes on to talk about loving our enemies. Have you ever heard anything so ridiculous? And he leaves us with this thought. It's kind of laying there for us to pick up that perhaps God loves those people as much as he loves us. And therefore, maybe we ought to as well. The world hates these kinds of thoughts. The world wants to normalize sin. The world wants sinful things to be okay because we live in it. We wallow in it. We want to be able to, uh, to have those things be a part of our life without guilt. And so the world continues to explain it away and create situations where these things are okay. A few of them that I was thinking of, the world says, go ahead and shack up. Don't worry about that piece of paper. It's just a piece of paper. What could it really be worth? And I say, if it's just a piece of paper, then why not take care of that little worthless piece of paper? Because we know it's not just a piece of paper, don't we? The world also says, when you do that, it doesn't matter what gender that person is. 
How about it's okay to cheat and lie a little bit? Nobody knows. No big deal. Besides, you probably deserve more anyway. You probably deserve whatever you can get. How about it's okay to take revenge on somebody who's done something wrong to you? They acted first, whereas God says, vengeance is mine. We say things like, as long as nobody gets hurt. Nobody got hurt, so no big deal. No harm, no foul. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We say all these things to normalize sinful behavior. God has a different standard. Jesus has a different standard. With a wink and a smile, we push all these thoughts of sin and righteousness aside. We just don't want to deal with that. We don't want to deal with our own stuff. So we put it all in a box called privacy and we hide it away in a closet. As long as we don't talk about it and don't deal with it, it just goes away. If we give Jesus space, if we give him time, if we give him leverage in our lives, he will show us, mostly through this book. This is one of the reasons why we stand here at this pulpit and preach from this book and encourage you to spend time in this book because we want you to be like him. As disciples, our goal is to be like Jesus, to sin less and be more righteous in our actions, our attitudes, and who we are. Give him time and space, he'll expose sin and reveal righteousness. Another way Jesus as the light affects us is that he exposes lies while he reveals the truth. Later in this very same chapter, chapter 8, in this dialogue he's having with these people, they make this bold claim that they're Abraham's children. And then they go on to make an even bigger claim, we are God children. He is our only father, the father in heaven. Keep that in mind as you listen to what Jesus says in verse 44. You belong to your father, the devil. Do you think that made them a little angry? And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet, because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. And I think what we have here is people, religious leaders who've studied the word and preached the word, but they've allowed so many lies and so many uh, warped views to creep in about God himself and about the Messiah to come and about what salvation is and what, what the law really is uh, asking from them, so many lies have creeped in that when the truth shows up and God himself is standing in front of them in the flesh, the Messiah, representing all that scripture says the Messiah is going to be, they don't recognize it. They don't recognize Jesus for who he really is. They have such a warped and distorted view based on the lies that they have been telling and heard themselves for many, many years. Well, we are in the same boat and I was thinking about some of the lies that, that our culture and our society tells us and that we, in some ways, you know, maybe not blatantly, but in a lot of ways we kind of grab onto these and incorporate into our own lives. And so I'm, I'm going to give you a few of them. How about this one? I got to do what's best for me. Now, I like sports. I watch a lot of sports. I pay attention to sports. And I hear athletes say this kind of thing all the time. What it really means is, I'm going to sign a bigger contract for another team and I'm leaving. But it's couched in this, hey, I got to do what's best for me. They're not the only ones, politicians, uh, actors, musicians, all kinds of people of influence will use that to make their decision. I got to do what's best for me. All I can say is I'm glad Jesus didn't have that standard. How about this one? And this, we got to be careful of because this falls under the umbrella of the church and the household of faith, that faith brings fortune. A lot of very famous uh, preachers out on YouTube and other forums telling us these kinds of things. Be careful. There are a lot of people suffering for the name of Jesus, imprisoned, tortured, losing their lives, taking everything 
Everything that they have is being taken away from them because they will not recant on loving Jesus. The, this, this last one that I have here is one that really makes me gag every time I hear it. And that is this one. We got to follow our hearts. You got to follow your heart. Listen to your heart. What is your heart telling you to do? That's what you should do. And we see this a lot in movies where the, the hero will be faced with a decision that's going to change the whole course of the story. And uh, they'll be trying to figure out what to do. And their wise friend, their wise counselor friend in the movie will, will listen. What is your heart telling you? And suddenly that's supposed to be this light bulb moment. Now I know what to do. Except that this book tells us something different. Jeremiah says, your heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked or sick, depending on how you translate that. I'm going to suggest that's not the best source of decision making. This book is a much better source of decision making. Get to know this book. Spend time in it. Read it. Let the Spirit work in your life as you read those words. A third way that uh, Jesus affects the world as the light is that he exposes the futility of death while revealing his offer of light. It was tempting to go to uh, John chapter 11 for this one, but there's an incredible I am statement there that we're going to hear in a few weeks. So I don't want to tread on that one. I went to a different story that maybe actually illustrates Jesus as the life giver maybe even a little better in terms of what I want to say here today. And I got it in Luke chapter 7. I want to read this very quickly, starting in verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples in a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her... His heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Now, we can see this dead man being raised from the dead, and that's an incredible moment. I don't, wanna, I don't want to downplay that at all. But the wow factor of someone being raised from the dead is huge. And this is an obvious Jesus as the life giver moment. It's, it's so obvious, you don't need me to explain that. There's another life being saved here, though. There's another person being given life in this story. And that's the woman that we encounter in this story. In fact, this is more a story about her than it is this man being raised from the dead. And what we learn is that she is a widow. And in the ancient world, like it or not, women were very dependent on men to sustain them, to give them food, shelter, clothing, all the things that they needed. That's just the way the culture of the ancient world was. I'm not trying to make a, a good, bad sort of evaluation of it. It's just the way it was. And so uh, a woman would be dependent on her husband. Well, if he dies, now she has to find another source, and the first next line of help would come from sons. What we're seeing here is that she only had one son, and that son is the one in the coffin. So there's three sources of grief going on here. Number one, the husband is dead. Number two, the son is dead. Number three, there's only two ways for a woman in her position to support herself for the most part, in the ancient world. And one is begging, and the other is prostitution. Neither of those, nobody would ever choose either of those as their first, uh, as plan A. Nobody would do that. She is looking at this with a very tainted picture of her future. I think that's why Jesus focuses on her. When he sees her, his heart goes out to her. And it's very telling that at the end of the story, Jesus gave him back to his mother, restoring her life in so many ways. It reminds us that Jesus is here to give life. In John 10.10, 10, a couple chapters later, he says, I'm here to give you life. Yes, eternal life, 
but an abundant life now, a life that's worth living now, a life that has meaning now, a life that you don't want to give up. And that's what he's restoring to this woman right here. Well, what is the end result for us? Here's where I want to land and and, uh, finish with. What about us? What does this mean to us, really? We are disciples. As disciples, we're supposed to become like our teacher, like our leader, like our master, which is Jesus. We follow him. We learn from him. We try to be like him. We make decisions, and we begin to uh, form our lives around the patterns that he set for us. Again, I want to go back to the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes series. We we walked through those Beatitudes, saw the progressive nature of it, how one thing leads to another, and at the end of that, you have somebody who's who's in this vital, uh, deep, committed relationship with God, and there are consequences to that, and there are good things. There are blessings and consequences to following Jesus. And the result of that, he follows up very quickly with two things that we are as disciples, once we, once we begin and, and are in the middle of that process, number one, we are the salt of the earth. This banner over here is what comes right after it. But it's quickly followed by what Justin was reading to us uh, just a little bit ago, that we are the light of the world. And that's who we become. That's, that's what happens when we are citizens of the kingdom. And we begin to take on the character of the kingdom. And, and as citizens, we progress as believers in Jesus and, and Christians, people who are citizens of that kingdom of Jesus. We become salt and light to the world. And in this case, we think about light. Where does it come from? Well, for, for us, almost all of our light comes from the sun. We get our light from the sun. Even at night, when the moon is shining, it's not really creating any light on its own, right? But we see it. We see the light, and it it reflects onto us. And there have been times, and you've probably noticed this too, when the, the moon is so bright that you can actually see a little bit of a shadow if you're walking somewhere uh, out in the bright moonlight. Well, just as the moon reflects the light of the sun, we reflect the light of Jesus. He is the source of that light. When he says, I am the light of the world, and then tells us we are the light of the world, he's saying, you do what I do. So as Jesus exposes sin and reveals righteousness, get out there, live in such a way that it exposes sin and reveals righteousness. Just as Jesus exposes the lies of the world and reveals the truth, get out there. Tell people the truth. Tell them what the lies are. Live it. And then, just as Jesus exposes the futility of death, death without him as as your Savior, tell them what life is like with Jesus, eternal and current. That's who we are. That's the result in our lives. That's the the supposed result in our lives. Hopefully, we are lights to the world, and as people watch us live, they know there's something different. They know we live by a little different system, and hopefully, it's appealing. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that just as you are the light of the world, that we would be lights in some way as well, that we would reflect who you are, we would reflect your purposes, we would accomplish in our lives the things that you want to accomplish in our lives, that we would be people who live in such a way that sin, lies, and death are not a part of who we are, but that righteousness and truth and life are obvious to those around us and maybe desirous to those around us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you please